from and all that kind of stuff. So, so we get an idea of who your ancestors were, you know, yeah. on both sides of the family. Yeah. So, well, yes. can I say yeah. that she has the cleanest bloodline that people have ever seen? She goes back to the last pagan king of Ireland called Dahi, and her ancestor was Sir Roger O'Shocknessy. Why are you laughing? <laughs> we were laughing at you with your finger in the air. Yeah, she knows. She she is descended from aristocracy. And his daughter, Sir Roger O'Shaughnessy, her ancestor. No, seriously, my cousin did it all. He's okay. dead now. And she is, uh, he used to write letters to Henry VIII. And he sent his daughter to be educated in England by Henry VIII at the castle. And they come from uh, Kinvara. Oh. And there's lots of castles around there. Oh, shocknessy. So My father. There, you don't know who you're talking to, <laughs> Izzy, do you? God. Except we called it Oh, shocknessy. <laughs> Well, that's, well, that's, it's always called Sheila, Sheila, or Sh Sheila Shockensee. I know, well, that was so wrong. I know. Because there is an O. I know. And I a know lot that. of ignorant people. Oh, you say O. Oh, the O. called in Tremor, Sheila Shockensee. Anyway, that is beside the point. Yeah. That was my grandfather. these people out of the room. I think so. They argue among themselves. <laughs> okay. Shut up, Jan. I'm wrong. Okay. Zip. <laughs> so, over to you. Tell us about your family, where they came from and all that. My father's family came from the west of Ireland, Clare. And my mother's family, she was a Connington, and her father was the um, managing director of the steamship company in Waterford. But before that, he was living in Limerick. And he had three daughters, my mother and Dodie, her sister, and Auntie Chris, her other sister, um, daughter. And my mother died when I was six. And Dodie was living with us at the time. And she was like a mother to the three of us growing up. And... Um, Could I go back a little bit? You said the steamship company. Who was the steamship company that that's in? Now, you know where the Tower Hotel is? That was the offices of the steamship company. And uh, I don't know who, but he was the managing director of it. And he lived up Newtown. And his boatman would take him to work in the morning. He himself would walk down there. The back of their house had a big... Neptune house. Um, Neptune house. A jetty at the end of it. Is that what you call it? Yeah. And he'd have his boat there. And the boatman would boat him down to his office on the quay, on the mall there. So it was... Uh, and do, do you remember your mum before she died? My mother, very vaguely. I was six. I do remember her vaguely. She playing with me. And hyacinths always remind me of her. She always smelt beautifully of hyacinths or something like that. And she was a lovely, gentle person. That's all I remember about her. Uh, but her sister, Dodie, was so good to us. She never married. She was going to marry this man in the Indian Army, British Indian. And uh, she couldn't because she had to then look after her father, who was a widower. And she had to look after and housekeep for him. I remember her talking about him and talking about she used to go boating with her boyfriend and she had her hand in the water one day boating along and she dropped a beautiful bracelet into the water. Those little things, you know, it's, they would stick in my mind that she would tell me about. Yes, she was lovely. Dodie was terribly kind to us. She was a mother to us, really. She died when I was 18, which was far more serious to me because at 18, you were... You were Understand everything, yeah. So there you are. And, and, and when you were small, then did you live here in Tremor? Yes, we did. We lived in. I was born on the terrace. Do you know the terrace in Tremor, opposite the AIB? Oh yes, yes. Yeah. yes. I was born there, and uh, I do remember living there. Even we were about. I was five when I left there, so my mother had one year to live. Mm. She moved up to Patrick Street then because she 
uh, it was near her for her, I imagine, for her to go to mass. And um, but she died there, and then we moved down to the south, to the south, to the um, end of Patrick Street, where I lived. Then going to school and had lovely times. I did love Tremor then. I still love Tremor. And what are your early memories of that period? Like you say, the people around the area, or the shops, or the characters. Oh, the shops were fabulous. At the top of Train Hill. We had a shop there where our bridge club is now, but it was the underneath part of our bridge club. And there was an old woman there called Miss Power. And she had a shop. I used to love going into it. She sold everything in the shop, you know, that sort of place. She had uh, cakes with cats sitting on the cakes in the window. She had... Um, Sweets, which we loved. We didn't care about what cats sat on anything. We'd eat them. And she was a lovely woman. It was a marvellous shop. And after her then came a ladies' shop, ladies' wear. Miss... Oh, I can't think of her name. Don't worry about the names. No, I can't remember her name, but she had a lovely shop there and her niece lived with her. And then uh, there was a lovely shop in Main Street called Well Helds. What his real name was, I can't remember, but the reason he was called Well Held was that he, his wife threw something at him one day and he caught it and they say, Well Held. And his name, I don't know why he got that name, Well Held. But we never called him anything but Well Held's job. And he had cats in the window and he had flower bags in the shop white flower and a black cat just jump around them and she'd be white in a few minutes and we just love all that excitement excitement the children today would not even notice it and she had he had cakes in the window off that I wasn't allowed to eat I wouldn't be allowed to eat them they were I think they were called Eccles cakes or something they were made with lots of veg of uh, fruit and Dodie will say, you are not to buy those, you're not to eat them. They are the scrapings off the bakery floor. <laughs> and they put all the scrapings into them. But he was a great old man, old, well-held. Great man. I can't think of his name. And then we had, um, down opposite Michael's, Carl, Michael Carl, opposite him, still in Main Street, I think it's a Chinese restaurant now, we, there was a lovely shop where you could buy needles and thread and all that stuff for school. I'd go down there in the morning to buy my knitting needles for school. I used to remember all their names and I can't anymore. I don't know why. Old age, I suppose. And uh, who else was there? And of course, I remember the L and N when it came to, when it was in Tremor first. And that was just beside that shop in Main Street. And then it moved over to where Ollie the Butcher was. The LNN moved to there. And then eventually, I think, it moved up to where it is now. And um, there was a lovely shop, Carl's shop, which is now, what is it now? The V. That too became a post office. With, uh, it was still, Greta Carl used to run that. She was a great woman in Tremor, Greta Carl, well known, very well known lady, very nice person. These people spoke to you as children. And today I think, well, I don't go out at all now, but the children of my age, my growing up, we loved old people and we loved talking to them. And I don't know, know if young people talk to old people today or not. I think they have too much with their exercises when they come home from school. They have so much homework to do. The poor kids don't have time to go down on the beach, I think. We always went on the beach after school, always. It was part of our life. And, and yes. just to go, where did you go to school then? 
I went to school up here to the convent in Tremor until I became 13. And then I went into Waterford to the Aslan convent. We had to go in on the bus or the train. And uh, I loved it. I loved that school, both of them. And the Arsene was a boarding school that time? No, no, no. I was at the day school, St. Anne's. We used to um, go in on the bus or the train. And we'd have great fun going in on the train because one carriage would be full of water park schoolboys and the other carriage would be full of girls like ourselves from the Arsene. And they used to, oh, they used to make fun of us and laugh at us and make tricks. Oh, they were dreadful. But we did like them. We were all pals, we were all friends. Yeah. And they grew up and we all grew up. And I remember my father one night, one night at home saying to me, Sue, he said, you know, I've got to pay money to the railway company. I said, why daddy, what do you want, why? Because he said, the carriage I was sitting in today was full of your name. You know, in those days, it was only upholstery to there, and then it was wooden. And they'd have my name and Jackie, Jackie Welsh was his name, the fellow from the um, water park. And Jackie and Love Sue. It was written all over the carriage, and he told me he'd have to pay. I was mortified. So I said, oh, I didn't do that, Daddy. It wasn't my fault. Somebody else did that. We did have fun, though. God, when I think of it, you know. It was very innocent fun, yes, but very lovely. And then where did you, like, you mentioned Jackie there. Uh, where did boys and girls, where did they go to meet? And all that kind of stuff? We met on the beach. We met around tomorrow walking. We walked and walked every day after school. First of all, we'd come home from school. Uh, Mary Fox, Bernie Manahan, Mary Manahan, Pat Halley, who lived in Main Street. They had a garage there. And uh, Mary Fox. And we'd go down on the beach after school and meet them. And we'd have such fun. And then um, we'd have picnics in the summer. And Joe Malloy, who was a butcher here, lovely man, Joe Malloy, Mr. Malloy, he would lend us his, um, it was like a hay wain, you know, the flat uh, the horse and cart they put hay on, flat. Like the hay wain painting. Uh, what's his name? John Constable. Constable's painting, that hay wain that you sit on. A crowd of us would go with on that. And we'd be we'd go out to Bonmahan, which is a beach outside Tremor. And we'd have a picnic. And fun. Lots of innocent fun. And of course how we didn't there were big holes in the fields where the mine it was a copper mine. And the mines used to go down in the field and how we didn't. Playing around them, we'd go to the edge. Children, if I saw a grandchild of mine doing it today, I'd kill them. They'd go on the edge and we'd look down to see the mine and we'd throw stones down to see how far it was going. But we were never afraid, but we'd have been killed by adults if they saw us doing it. And, um, and you'd hear it dropping, but that was the Ban Mahan copper mines. And when I mar married an Englishman, my husband, who you swear to me that wasn't a copper mine, it was a tin mine. I would say no, Dudley, because on the cliffs underneath, you now you could see green lines in it where the copper was, you know. Mm. But it was a lovely life. It was a beautiful childhood in Tremont. It was so innocent. And we knew everyone. I knew everyone on this road. I knew everyone living over there. And likewise with... Geraldine's parents, we knew everyone. And uh, you were saying earlier on that there was actually quite a lot of interesting characters back then. Oh, the characters, yeah. <laughs> we had, which you know and have heard of, Limerick Bill. And Limerick Bill was his hat. Oh, my brother had a court case with Limerick Bill one time. My brother defended him in court. 
Poor Limerick Bill, who wouldn't steal a button. Was We had the army here at the time, the Irish army here in Tremor, construction corps. And he was found, poor Limerick Bill was found with an army blanket. And somebody, who I don't know, said he had stolen it. Limerick Bill wouldn't touch anything, didn't belong to him. And so Kevin, my brother Kevin, God rest him, he had to defend him in court. And Limerick Bill came to our house that morning and he sat down out in the garden and he had my father's big top coat on him with a, a belt around it. My father had died and Kevin had given him his big heavy coat. And Limerick Bill sat there with his hat on and his flowers and his hat, waiting for Kevin because he was finishing his breakfast and he was going to drive him in to court. So he drove him in and he defended him and he got him off, he did. Limerick Bill wouldn't steal anything. In fact, I used to give him books uh, to read and magazines because he liked to read. He was an educated man. And he lived up in the 24s, they call them now, those little houses. And I would say to him, he'd say to me, do you want those books back, ma'am? Because I can't give them back to you. No, Bill, I'd say, I don't want them back because the rats will eat them. The rats in his house would eat the paper. I said, no, no. But he was a lovely man with children as there were so many lovely old men in those days with children, so kind to us. And we were very respectful and loved old people. Even old Miss Tobin, God love her. She lived in a bathing box, just up here behind, it was Spencer's house in those days. There was a field, no houses built there. And she had this bathing box and she was keep ducks, little ducks. And uh, she lived with her brother, Sammy, Sammy Tobin, in Grand Hotel Square, in a beautiful house, one of those big houses. And uh, when her parents were alive and when they died, both Sammy and herself went a little bit odd. And she, they had to leave the house. I don't know where he went to live, but that's where she went. And she used to um, walk around Tremor and she'd take flowers out of a dustbin, not out of your garden, but out of a dustbin. And she'd bring them to your house to sell them to you. And people would buy them to give her money. She wouldn't take money. She'd say, my, my aunt gave her money one day. She said, take it away and give it to the poor. She had a very lovely accent, Miss Tobin. And she would... We, caught, uh, we were children, we were coming from school one day and we met her up in Pond Road and she was going, and she was wearing um, ash, ash cloth, ash cloth and what do they say? And ashes. She wore like a sack around her and, a, and another one for her skirt. And she, we said to her, hello, Miss Tobin. And she said to us, don't say hello. That's the devil's word. Say, good evening, Miss Tobin. It's very grand. So we say, good evening, Miss Tobin, then every time we saw her. She was a dear old soul, but very, very eccentric. Very. Like the children wouldn't mock her or anything? Oh, like that. no. We wouldn't attempt to mock her. Never. No. Only in that case, we'd say, hello, Miss Tobin. And she would say, don't say hello. No, 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 we wouldn't. We were respectful of old people and people that were not quite the thing. Of course we were. We, I still am. I don't know, you mustn't mock people. It's wrong. I think when you mock people, I think it's very sad. They can't help it. She couldn't help being eccentric. That's the way she was. And those kind of eccentric people, that was kind of like acceptable in a sense. Very acceptable in Tremor. <laughs> we had so many of them. I couldn't tell you how many. And her brother, Sammy, he wasn't quite... She used to get letters 
when they lived up in Tremont, in uh, Grand Hotel Square, she, I was told this now by an adult, by my aunt, I, I wouldn't have remembered it. When she was younger, she would get letters from the milk, she thought she got letters from the milkman. And she would write him back a letter on an ivy leaf and leave it with the milk in the mornings for him. She truly believed he was writing to her. But Sammy then, her brother, he used to work. Sammy worked for Cafolas. They were the ice cream people, Italians. And they had a beautiful ice cream shop down at the top of the prom. I don't know what it is now. Piper's Amusements, I think. I don't know. Oh, I know what it is now. They have apartments built there now. Just at the top of all of the strip. There, there was a lovely shop with a big, long wooden floor going into it that sold um, Italian ice cream, Carfalas. Beautiful ice cream. And they had a place in Dublin. Carfalas were famous. You wouldn't remember them in Dublin, no. And um, they were the only ice cream people, makers of ice cream in those days. They were Italian. And Sammy drove their push driver, their push cart, down the beach with ice cream barrels in it to sell on the beach long, long ago. Poor Sammy. You'd love to see Sammy Tobin coming along with the ice cream. But he too was a lovely old man. Or would they ring a bell or would they shout? No, they wouldn't. And no music. No. My other daughter told me she had a friend, and this is horrible, who used to tell her children that when they heard the music playing in the ice cream cart, it meant it was empty. All the ice cream was sold. I said, that's the cruelest thing I've ever heard. It was so mean of the mother to tell the Anyway, that's and, another story. And you mentioned the bathing boxes. Uh, oh, the, the bathing boxes. Lady, right? yeah. But down the beach, it was very normal, wasn't it? Very normal. They were always there, always. So tell us a little bit about it. Um, the ones here, Mrs Chapman and Miss, Mrs Dunn ran them, owned them. And then the Kents owned them after they died. And they were, they had wheels on them. And my aunt and her sister, my mother, the three of them, before my mother was married, when they would come to Tremor for holiday, they were taken swimming by the bathing men, w women, the bathing women. Not me, not at my age. They were, I suppose we wouldn't allow them, I don't know, we just didn't do it. And they used to take them swimming and they'd go into the boxes to undress and then the bathing women, because the tide would, they wouldn't be allowed with the tide out there now. It's out too far. It had to be in. And they would take them out of the box and bring, bring them, drag them with their arms down to the water and dump them in it, whether they wanted to or not. And Auntie Chris, her sister, my mother's sister, hated them. And she would scream and she used to be dumped in the water and one day she jumped out and ran up the hill up to shallows. Yes. And she um, she became a nun afterwards. Yes, I'm sure she was ashamed of herself when she heard that. But the uh, bathing women were very hard on children that didn't want to go in the water. They'd push them in. Um, the men was then were down on the men's slip. Men and women were not allowed to swim together. And the men's slip had bathing boxes too. And they'd push them out on the wheels for the men. And the little steps going down into the water. And they'd have their swim. Get in. Oh, was it for modesty or was it oh, for... Oh, modesty, of was course. Modesty. Yes. You wouldn't see anyone bathing there with a towel around them. No. It was modesty, I suppose. It was... Yeah, it must. And nuns used to swim out of the ladies' cove, which was gorgeous, and it's gone now. It was under Myers. Uh, where Myers have a house nowadays, across the road from them, down steps, 
was the ladies' cove. We used to love to go there, very private and very quiet and lovely. And that's where the nuns used to sleep. Is this out the Donnery out there? Um, that was out Newtown Road, out Cliff Road, oh. the Cliff Road, going out to the Metal Man. Mm. And the, it was a lovely place to swim. You used to like it and lie on the rocks out there. And that's where the nuns were allowed to swim because it was only the ladies. Men never went down there. Ever. Or boys, never, no. And uh, the Gillamian was another place. And then when you were kind of getting, we say, a little bit older, would you, like, was there a cinema in Tremor? Yeah, we had a cinema called the Rex. Oh, yes. It was where Michael's shop is now, Michael Carr's shop, in Main Street. It was lovely, lovely. We loved it when it came to Tremor. The Rex Cinema. Yes, indeed. And uh, we loved all the movies. Mm -hmm. and, and what about um, um, dances? Did you go to dances? Oh, yes. I was over 18 before I went to a dance. Well, everybody is, I suppose. Because, oh my God, I'd be terrified to go into a dance hall with fellows in it. How foolish can you get? But then I got so fond of it, you couldn't keep me out of it. It was down here where the amusements are nowadays. And it was called the Atlantic Ballroom. And we'd have a first session and a second session. And that would mean the first session ended around, I don't know, 11 or 12. And then the second session, us, because we lived here. All the Waterford people would go home on train or whatever. The last train. And then we'd be here and we'd go to the second session. We loved it. It was fabulous. But no drink. No drink was ever, ever. If a fellow asked you, would you like a drink? And you said, oh, yes, I would. Between dances, you'd get lemonade and a, a, a biscuit. And the biscuits were curry creams. I'm sure you all remember curry creams. Curry creams and... A, a glass of lemonade, and that was your treat. And to get that, my God, you were really, really happy, yes. And what kind of bands were they? We had Phil Murtha and his band. And Phil Murtha was a Dublin man, a Dublin band, and they came to tour every summer. And his band, and he was marvellous. His band was great. Phil Murtha, he was a lovely man, I remember him. I remember meeting him on the train hill one day and a few of his men and I was coming off the train and they asked me, where are you, where have you been? You know, the way you'd ask a silly question. Oh, I was in a school, I said, at, um, it was a uh, shorthand and typing school. And I said, it was McNamara's. And they started singing. My name is McNamara, I'm the leader of the band. And that was the first time I ever heard that song. And I got to know it very well afterwards. Yeah, they sung it the whole way down Train Hill. We had that big hill to walk every day we came from school. But we didn't mind it then, we thought it was... And, and were you a good dancer? No, oh, I was never a good dancer, no. Never a good dancer, no. I loved it, but I wasn't any good at it. Not really. Um, I knew a few fellows that were very good dancers. I used to love when they'd ask me to dance. Yeah, they were very good dancers. And they'd pull you around. But there were some fellows, my God, some fellows in from the country. And we used to call them the, the pump. They'd pump you up and down like this, like a water pump, you know. And we'd say, oh, my God, look at him. He's coming over to ask me to dance. And I said to Sheila, my sister, one day, she was sitting beside me. This fellow came over to ask me to dance. And I said to Sheila, will I dance with him? In front of the man. And she said, of course you will. Go out and dance. Oh, it was hell. He was up and down like this. But that was the dancing for them. But there were a few good dancers, yes. And generally, would it be normal to say yes if someone asked you to dance? Oh, well, very normal, because you don't refuse them. <laughs> it would be very rude to refuse. But I had to ask her, because I thought she'd eat me if I go out with him. He's awful. 
But she didn't. She said, yes, go with him. And I went for my sins. But it was a lot. We loved the dances then. The second session especially, because we were from all people and the visitors would be at that, you know. I remember meeting um, Bernie Manhattan was a great friend of, my, friend of mine. Bernie Sherry, as she is now, she lives in Dublin. She had a shop at the end of Train Hill. And we used to watch these fellows arriving off the train from Dublin on their holidays. And one day these guys arrived off and uh, we were chatting to them. And one, I said, and what's your name? Oh, he said, you wouldn't be able to pronounce it if I told you. I said, I would, why not? What is it? Oh, Shocknessy, he said. This is true. I said, that's my name. Well, we both roared laughing. It was his name, but he thought it was too long. He, I, I couldn't pronounce it. But that was a coincidence. Bill or Shocknessy, we became great friends, all of us. And we used to go lovely walks in Tremor, out to the Metal Man. You've heard of the Metal Man? You have to hop around him three times to get married. I can assure you, I never hopped around. It was all broken stones underneath. You couldn't hop. It go through your feet. So we didn't hop. But it was lovely to look at him. You'd have to go out at the edge of the cliff and look up at him. And he was a big old sailor. He had old-fashioned sailor, dressed in a navy top and white trousers. And he was painted... Not every year, but when he was painted, he looked marvellous. And he had a ponytail. He was lovely. I always loved looking at him. But a, a hard face. And his thing was, he put his hand out, keep out, keep out, keep out for me, for I am the rocks of misery. He you say, because a ship came in there one time when there was no metal man there, and it went up, which a lot of them did, went on the rocks and was... Um, broken but um they used to say on a stormy night he'd wake up and he'd say keep out keep out keep out for me and we would long to hear him say it but you wouldn't go out there on a stormy night so you never heard him those were the stories of long ago um, uh, where did you did you you said you did secretarial did you work then after school I did, for a little while. I um, worked, we had a lovely hairdresser here down called Suzanne. And I worked there. Is that the kettle boiling? No. You're fine, you're fine. Um, <coughs> yes, I did. And I, I was there until I got married. Then I got married and went to Africa. And that was How the end. did you meet your husband? I met him. In the Grand Hotel one night, I was with some people and he was with others and I saw him over there standing at the piano. Mm. I think his father was playing, he was a great pianist. He was playing and Dudley just stood there and I met him. And I went out with him, he asked me to come out with him the next day, you know, the usual sort of thing and then we met and that was it. But he had to go back to England because he was English. Mm. And the, early, the Grand Hotel at that time, was, it was quite grand, wasn't it? Oh, it was beautiful. Miss Murphy owned it. Miss Murphy and her father. Well, her father was dead before my time, but it was a very beautiful hotel. And um, the furniture in it and it all creton f um, covers on the chairs and... The dining room was beautiful, as was the Majestic in those days, too. We just loved going to both of those hotels. And the food was excellent. It's closed today, and I don't know why. And, and the visitors that were staying there, obviously, they must have had a few bars. Oh, yes, yes, they did, they did. There was, uh, there was a house, you know those apartments over there? I don't know their name. They were, that was a big house and they knocked it down and built apartments. But before that, it was a, a lovely, lovely old house. And the bishops and important people, 
that came to stay on the ground or sent there to sleep. Yes, it was a very lovely place. But Miss Murphy had a grand hotel, but I don't know what it's like now. It's not, I don't think it's open now. No, it's closed, oh. yeah, which is a shame. And so when you miss your late husband, yes. um, was it? Was there a connection straight away? Was there... Straight away. Okay. Straight away, yeah. Did I hear a snort of derision? I did. But well, my that's Joe Kennedy. It was horrible. Just horrible. It's personal, anyway. It's personal. It's very. I always said it. And and um, so he then had to go away. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, so then, did you correspond? Oh, every day I had a letter from him. Not every second day, every day. And I'd be cross when it would be uh, holidays, like Easter holidays or something, and the postman would be on holiday. Yes, we wrote to one another every day. And it was writing, not telephoning. Not mobile phones, we didn't have those things. Yeah, so and, that was it. And like the present generation wouldn't even know what a letter is. Right? No, they so, wouldn't know how to write a letter. Yeah, so I mean... What was what was your general the letters writing to each other at that stage? What were you saying things to each other? Which what happened every day? Okay. Yeah, what happened? Yes, indeed, and uh, stories we would say to one another. I suppose I I I, I yeah. And but people won't believe me when I say I got a letter every day. They think, well, of course, and then my granddaughter. He was at um, Birmingham University then. He hadn't qualified when I met him first for about, I'd say, six months. Then he qualified. He was a lawyer. He, um, uh, Nicola, my granddaughter, my other daughter's daughter, went to that university. And when I went to stay with them, she said, Grammy, you must come and see Grandpa's university. So I did. And, you know, it was so lovely to see it. And there's a big clock in the centre. Do you know Birmingham? I know Birmingham, but I've never been to the university. No. There's a big clock in the centre of it that you can see from either, and it's called Old Joe. Mm. And I didn't know then when he was alive that he had a big clock in there. That, and she said to me, that's... The clock Grandpa used to look at when he was late for lectures and he'd run. I said, Nicky, your grandfather was never late for lectures. Not Dudley Boyle. He wouldn't be late, no. He was very, very on the dot all the time. And very when precise. You got, when you got married, did you move away then out of Chimor? Yeah, we did live away. Mm. And then when you came back then, did you see much changes? I did, Yeah. I saw a lot of changes, even in the Grand Hotel. I saw changes. Yeah, a lot of them. In uh, the way people treated things, respected things, and I don't know, it was a different life, different life. Mm. But, and today it's completely different. I wouldn't understand the little darlings of today have a lot to put up with, I think, in schoolwork and everything. And their computers and their mobile phones and all they've got to work on today must be hell. And, and to, go back, I don't to go back to your early memories, days, mm -hmm. like, <clears throat> Tremor also had a kind of a, we say, a Protestant aristocracy or kind of a Protestant wealthy class, like the from the Quakers and from the... Uh, I didn't know many Quakers in Tremor. The only Quaker I knew was Mr. Strangman, and he was a darling, lovely old man. Um, and, uh, oh yeah, Miss Smithick, Smithick's Brewery, she was a Quaker. She was a big fat lady who used to ride a bicycle and use an umbrella during a thunderstorm and lightning. That's all I remember her for. And 
My brother used to say, my God, she'll be struck by lightning because she couldn't hold an umbrella when the lightning was... Anyway, that was another day. And the Strangmans, were they, were they the uh, shipping people? No, the brewery. Oh, the brewery. Mm, okay. mm. Strangman's Brewery. And, I mean, um, and what about the war time? Did you... Did you oh, I was here during the war. Of course I was. Um, I was at school during the war. And I remember coming home from school one day and coming up Train Hill, round the corner into my house, and there was a crowd of people. And I said, what are all the people doing here? There was a bomb went off in the garage. Um, Reddy, Chapman, a lovely fellow called Chapman, his mother had the bathing boxes down there. He and a man from Riverstown, I've forgotten his name, and, uh, oh yeah, Mrs. Thing's brother. But they had found, they'd found a brass. It was, I suppose, a bomb of some description, out in Gararus or some of those beaches out there. And they brought it in to pour already, um, what was his name? Anyway, they brought it into the garage because they had a blow lamp and they thought he'll be able to open it. They put the blow lamp on the bomb and it blew up and blew them apart. And he was in a dip mending a car and he was saved. Mm. But the others were killed. There were three of them dead. And I came home from school and I saw my aunt used to read detective books, you know, she loved books, she loved reading. And I saw a book and it, the name of the book was Three Dead. And Sheila was there, my sister, they wouldn't tell me the three men were dead in case I'd be upset, which I would be. But those men were taken into where our bridge club is now, into the assembly rooms for that night. Yeah, uh, they weren't taken into hospital. They were taken in, they were dead. And it was a tra terrible tragedy, terrible. There were young men, Chapman, I remember, was a lovely young man. His mother was living in R Queen Street. Uh, who were they? I can't remember. Reddy. Reddy was saved because it was down in the pit mending a car. I... What about the Belgian refugees? The what, Al? Belgian refugees. Oh, yes. We had a man here in Tremor during the war. Lovely man, very respectful, very handsome, very well-dressed. And they said he was a spy. And he used to stay on the beach all day, looking out at sea. Now, what he was expecting, I don't know. But a girl from Waterford fell in love with him because I can't blame her. He was a gorgeous-looking man. And I'm, I imagine he would be very polite, you know, to her. She fell in love with him. And it was tragic because he never said what, who he was or what he was doing. But when the war ended, he left. He just left back to Germany. And she never knew why. That was dreadful for her. Yes, he was. And then we had a black man in Tremor. One black man. And we used to pay money to see him because we never had a black man before. We never saw black people. And is Keith writing a story there? No, I don't mind him. And he used to, he used to go down, he was down in the amusements. And, God, we were frightened of him, but he came to Mass one Sunday and he walked up the middle aisle to Mass, Wall Street, and everyone was shattered. He had every right to be. He was a Catholic and he was a very gentle man, I think. And um, then we had a woman, too, who used to have mice running up her sleeve and across here and down. I was terrified of her. I thought she was a witch. These were all people down the amusements. 
and we had people called the Coons. The Coons were, they had a stage and they used to come out singing and dancing and doing tricks. It was very nice and, and you didn't have to pay. You sat on a bench and looked up at them. Yeah. People used to come out from Waterford and that to see them and the visitors loved them, the Coons. But uh, those were the days and we had all the amusements, the things that fly around, hobby horses and swinging boats and it was a great place for children, it was. But we weren't allowed down uh, during race week, we wouldn't be allowed downtown, no. Uh, what, about, what about the uh, circus? Oh, we had the circuses just come. Duffy Circus and Fossil Circus. We loved when the circus came to town. Yeah, loved it. My father would put money on the hall table for us because he'd be in his office. He'd put money there for us to go to the circus that afternoon. It was a thrill to come home from school and to know the circus was in town. Mm -hmm. We never had real wild animals or anything there. Horses and dogs. And uh, elephants, yes. And uh, that's all. And the clowns, we were terrified of them because they made so much noise with their cars backfiring. Oh, they were horrible. But anyway, this was a lovely time. And race week? Race week was super. We loved race week. And in race week, they kept the horses at the back of the Grand Hotel, uh, near the library. Beside the library, there are old buildings, and they were the stables where the horses used to stay in those days when they came to Tremor, the race horses. And I just loved to see these beautiful animals being brought up out the gate, up. I used to go there to watch them, up to the race course. They were beautiful animals, shining velvet coats. And uh, my father used to take us to the races. And we had, you know, the turnstile. We were lifted over that, so we didn't have to pay. And um, Kevin, Sheila and I, we used to love going to the races with him. He'd back a horse, and of course, we'd all watch that horse going round. And one man one day said to my father, I couldn't see the race. I didn't look at the race. I was watching your three children cheering and getting excited when your horse came round. But you know, it was great excitement. Marvellous. And you had people selling vegetables and fruit coming from Moore Street in Dublin. They just come down. The fruit women with their bananas and oranges and that to sell them. This is years ago now. And... Um, it was, uh, well, to see a horse winning a race was, I suppose, like going to the Ritz now <laughs> in London. It was great excitement. Marvellous. And there were huge crowds. Sorry? What? Huge crowds. Oh, huge crowds. And Tremor would be full. The boarding houses, full. But today, no. They, go, they just come for the day. Yes, it was packed in Tremor in those days with people. And um, there was a lot of visitors who's come to Tremor, quite a lot. Kilkenny people especially. They loved to paddle in the water. The old farmers in September would come and they'd roll up their trousers and go out for paddles. They used to love the water. And little boys would come out from Waterford and they'd bring soap with them to bathe themselves. And they couldn't have a, you can't have a, a suds out of salt water. And they used to scrub and scrub with the soap, but no suds would come. We used to watch them. Poor little fellows. They never had a bath at home. They used to do that. And do you remember St. Vincent de Paul used to bring children out from water? I do. And I remember the, um, the uh, asylum people, they used to come out for the day, the men's asylum and the women's asylum used to come out for the day. And they'd have a crowd of them and walk them down the beach. Mm. And uh, 
then it might be the women's day. They wouldn't bring them all, both out together. There'd be different days. Yeah. Mm. Poor people. And uh, they were nice people. Oh. And did, did people swim all year round back then, or was it just... Not really. I never, in my youth, knew anyone swimming in the winter. Today they all do, but never then. We were all too scared, I suppose, just too cold. But they did in the summer, everyone loved it. I used to walk down the hill and the children would, my children, um, my grandchildren as well, and we'd walk down the hill and I'd meet um, Antoinette that you met, Antoinette Power, uh, Crane, and she'd be coming up the hill after a swim, and I'd say, Antoinette, is it warm? It's, oh, it's like soup, girl. And I'd know then the water was lovely and warm. God, it used to be beautiful. I used to be longing to get in. You know, Antoinette, she was a great swimmer, and she'd love the warm water. We used to swim, and you'd meet all the tall people there. It was very lovely. And were you a good swimmer? No. Bathe is the word. Bathing. Mm. I just love it. And where did how did the children learn to swim back then? How did they learn? Yeah. They had lessons out at Newtown Cove. Okay. Oh yes. Mm. We used to go out at Newtown Cove when we were brave, and never the Gillamine. Ladies, girls weren't allowed near the Gillamine. It was only for men. And in those days, girls respected us. They just didn't go there. We would, I never knew what the Gillamine looked like until I was well married and an old woman and went down the steps one day just to see it. But my brother swam there. Now, he was a daily swimmer. He used to swim in the winter. You're right. But always out of the Gillamine. And um, one day he told me he was swimming and he found a plank of wood, uh, not a plank, but um, a raft of wood. And he got up on it and he thought he was on a raft out of the Gillamine. Suddenly, his leg went through it and there was no one around. It was early morning before he went into the office. No one around and he was caught in this thing. Now, he could have drowned, but he was able to free himself in the end. And I said, that'll teach you to go out in the winter when there's nobody around. But he loved it. He loved swimming every day. And he worked in Waterford, did he? His office was in Waterford, in Gladstone Street. And he was also in the law, law area? He was a lawyer too. Yeah. Mm. When I was married, the headline of the paper said, Lawyer marries lawyer sister. Some st stupid person thought that one up. The Monster Express. And was that a... Um I mean, was it a family tradition? Was law in the family? Lawyers. Um, my father was the manager of the probate court, which was lawyer. Um, who else was lawyer? It was bankers and lawyers. My cousin Eddie, he, he was a banker in the Munster and Leinster. He was manager. And then his two sons and his daughter joined the bank. And his wife had been a banker. And um, who else was there? That was, lawyers, no. Grandfathers, no, no. And the Munster and Leinster, what bank did that become? The Munster and Leinster became the, um, at the top of uh, Glassstone Street. Was it, it wasn't the TSB, was it? Uh, no, the no. What? Was it the AIB? No. Do you know, I can't remember what the Monster and Lens... I should remember. Bank of Ireland, no? No, the Bank of Ireland was the bank that's on the quay. And come over then to the end of... If you go up to uh, Penny's, that road up, um, the edge there, there's a bank. What is that? AIB is at the end. Is it the... Yeah. Maybe it was the AIB. Oh, okay. Maybe it was the... Yeah, possibly AIB. What about the first night you left Tremor? What? The first time you left Tremor to go to your banker, uncle. Oh, I went up to, uh, he was in the bank in County Kilkenny, 
Callan. And I left more and went there on my holidays to them, to Eddie and Eileen, his wife. And it was a new thing for me to go on holidays to a, a country town. He was a bank manager there. That was the Munster Minster then. And across the road from him was the Bank of Ireland. So, aye, that's right, it would be the army. The Bank of Ireland. And the manager there was called... Berry, Mr. Berry. And all his children were called after berries. There was Holly Berry, Myrtle Berry, Ivy Berry. Oh, this is true. And the son was Rowan Berry. And we have a Rowan Berry in the garden, the tree. They were, they were all berries. And in those days, the banks were very grand and you had to go for afternoon tea. And if it was our turn to go, like Eddie and his wife and us, the children, we would go. But it was such a grand affair. You had, he, he had a client, Eddie, my cousin. He had a client out in the country who was a very wealthy farmer. And they called him a gentleman farmer. And his wife was the first time I had ever seen a mink coat. She had a mink coat. They were lovely people. But when you came in for a meal, we came in later to have um, dinner with them. We had people, servants at the back of our chairs, waiting to take our plates away. They were very grand people in the banks in those days. They all had their cards, as I had later on in the army life, which are um, a name and date of having your dinner and the clothes you were to wear, whether it was going to be dress or casual or whatever. And all that, yeah, that was it. And I loved it. It was, um, it was a, a, Callan wasn't big. It was a village, really. A lovely place. They all knew one another, obviously. And uh, their houses were very lovely and gardens were very beautiful. That was the first time. And in, in bed that night, I couldn't hear anything because I'd always hear the sea in Tremor. And I thought, my God, what is this? And then I heard this awful noise. It was a horse galloping down the street. I don't know who he was with, whether he was on his own or not. And I got a fright and I thought, oh, God, I don't like the silence. It was complete silence and darkness because you weren't near the sea. Did, yes. you, did you do horse riding yourself? We used to, with John Bobbs. It was Cream, Mr. Cream. He had horses. And Mary Fox and I used to come every day after school and done. We had, he had a lovely horse called John Bobbs. And we'd get up on John Bobbs, he, she and I, and in turn, and go down the beach on him. Oh, it was great fun. He was a lovely man, Mr. Cream. Yes, he was. He would have been uh, Antoinette's father-in-law. Mm. Or great-grandfather. No, Grand father-in-law. Grandfather-in-law, yeah. Um, A very lovely man. But did you ever go on the hunt? No, 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 no. I never went on the hunt. We used to love it, though. It came up Main St um, St 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 uh, Galway's Hill. Hill. Yeah, up Galway's Hill. And you'd see it and right at the windows, you see it coming up every Stephen's Day. Mm. And why did you not take part in all that? I wasn't interested, really. I wasn't that interested. And I didn't own a horse. You'd have to have a, a, a mansion to own a horse in those days. And, and, and I know you're talking about servants and all that kind of stuff, but I mean, it was a very different time, wasn't it? I mean, yeah. As regards the class system. Being well, we all had maids in those days, cause, and charwomen. Oh, we had a lovely charm called Mary Grace. Poor Mary, she was a pet. She looked out our window one day across the Pond Road and she saw these little trees in boxes that they had put out, you know. They just put them out. And I can't remember his name, Mr. He lived in that house that uh, McCarthy's lived in later. Anyway... He put out the trees the night before, we'll say. And Mary Grace was up in my bedroom. She looked up. 
Oh, my God, she said, look at the trees. They must have grown be electric. I never saw them before. <laughs> Poor Mary thought they'd grown overnight by electric. She was very simple, very, very simple, very simple. She was always terrified of dying. And she'd lay people out, as they called it in those days. She'd lay them out. You know what that is? And she'd be there when they were dying, and she'd lay them out. But the minute the habit would come in the house, she'd run out. She was terrified of a habit. And, and speaking of which, what was the rituals around death? Like, and what was the rituals? If someone died, what was... What was no if somebody died, if we were at school, now up here, I didn't do it in Waterford, up here, and you heard, oh, m Mrs. So-and-so died, long. you'd go straight to her house after school, to the wake, and the person, you never were afraid of dead people because you saw so many of them. She'd be lying in bed, dead. And you'd kneel down and say prayers for her. But the saddest thing I think I ever saw was when I was very young. I was at school up here, of course. And um, in the, we used to call them the poor houses, where Limerick Bell lived. In one of those houses lived this woman, I won't mention names now, her and her husband. And their little boy was seven, and he had died. And after school, well, we were told to go and pray for him. And we all went over, a few of us together at a time, and we went into the house and knelt down to say prayers. And there was this little boy who was seven, lying dead, you know. But you weren't afraid in those days. You weren't afraid of dead people. You saw them. And I used to say, oh, I wish I was him. Because he's made his first communion. He's going straight to God. Straight up. Whereas I was about 11. And I would maybe not do as I was told. And I thought I was a great sinner. And I would not go to heaven if I died. Because I had sinned. But he didn't. He was too little. And he just made his first communion. He'd go straight up. I used to envy him. But it was very sad to see him there, yes. And what about, uh, <clears throat> did people have beliefs in, we say, you know, we, you hear stories about the Banshee and all this kind oh, of stuff? Oh, yes. <gasps> Poor Kathleen that used to work for us. She was a housekeeper for us. Kathleen O'Keefe believed strongly in the Banshee. But you'd remember her. She worked for us too. Yeah, Cat. she was a, a, a maid of all works. She came one day and she heard the banshee, she said. And that night someone died. I think it was Bill, her husband. She went up to the telephone, because it was a public telephone near where they lived, to ring somebody and she heard the banshee. But she believed in the banshee. A lot of people did. Thank God I never heard her. But I was still afraid of her, that you might hear her. Uh, Banshee means the woman ghost. Ban is woman and she is ghost. The woman ghost. And if you saw, <laughs> my husband wouldn't believe this, if you saw comb on the f ground, the Banshee had dropped it the night before and you wouldn't touch it. No. Mm -hmm. And what are superstitions can you remember from way back? Superstition, wearing green. Never wear green, never wear green. Mary Shallow had a green, she used to do her work, she had a shop down here. She used to do her work on this baize green table. But she always had it covered in paper or some. She wouldn't work on the green. And uh, my aunt actually, Dodie, was very superstitious about green. Yes, she was. And you know, I was wearing a green suit. I wasn't. She died when I was 18. And after that, I used to choose my own clothes. And I wore a green suit when I met my husband first. So I don't think it was unlucky. And where did that superstition come from? Green. 
I don't know. I think Dodie told me somebody wore a green swimsuit out there one day swimming and they got very sick. <laughs> Whether that could be the reason, no, that wasn't. But green was, and you know Ireland, it's our colour. It was supposed to be very un unlucky colour. Did you ever hear that, any of you? My granny wouldn't wear green and she wouldn't allow it in the house. No, no. And I knew her granny very well, Mrs Power and more. And Mrs Power would have a big seat out across from her house under Granny Spencer's wall and she'd sit on it every summer. And she was the colour of copper. She was so brown. And I would say to her, Mrs. Power, you get got a lovely colour. How did you get so brown? Well, Sue, she'd say to me, every native to his own shore. And I always remember that. She meant from always where she got her colour. And she, uh, true, her husband was the same, more power. He had a bald head and was always brown. <laughs> always brown. She was a lovely lady, Mrs. P uh, Mrs. Pa Power. Power, yes, she was power, not Kennedy, yeah. Mrs. Power was a very nice lady. There's lots of powers in Tremor. Oh, a lot. And they all had nicknames, but I don't think she had. I never remember her. Only trying to explain her to somebody one day, I had to call her by her maiden name. Do you know what that was? Brown. Eile Brown. So she knew who I was talking about. Yeah, that was years later when I was growing up. I didn't know she was Eile Brown when I was a child. Yes, yeah, she was very nice. I knew her awfully well. And she'd always have birthday parties for her daughter, Kathleen. <laughs> always. And we'd come home from school and Dodie would say, Mrs Powers asked you to a birthday party for Kathleen. We'd be thrilled. We'd run down the hill to a birthday party. Oh, it would be great to go to one. And... Um, Poor Kathleen, God rest her. And what did you do at birthday parties back then, when you were small? I don't know. Fun. And ask me what fun is, and I wouldn't be able to tell you. We adored them. And we used to laugh and have fun and play games. And I don't know what it was. And, and hot, you know, pass the parcel and all these daft games. We loved them. And we'd get a lot of fun out of them. I think if you asked a child today to pass the parcel, think you're mad. And you mentioned uh, you mentioned playing bridge. Yeah, uh, I love What card bridge. games did you play when you were young? Any card games? Oh, when I was young, with Uncle John. Uncle John lived with us too. He was my mother's uncle, uh, John Connington. He was the man that was managing director of the steamship company's brother. He lived with us because he was a widower and he had no children and he had no body to live with. So he lived with us and Dodie, with my father. And um, people had relations to live with them in those days. Sorry, what was the question? Playing cards. Oh, cards. Uncle John adored a card game called Sevens. You've never heard of it since and neither have I. And we just play that, and my God, if you made a mistake, you were shouted at by him. <laughs> or if you tried to cheat. What? Is it a rummy kind of game? Or? It was uh, sevens. Now, what was it? You played sevens. I, I don't know. I can't remember. It was when I was a child we used to play it. Kevin, Sheila and I would have to sit down at night and play with him. But he was a lovely old man. And I used to clean his boots because he was very fat and he couldn't bend down and clean his boots. And he used to um, read the paper every day. I'd have to get the paper for him. And he'd buy us chocolates on the way from Mass every Sunday in a man's shop called Ducky Hutton. Did you ever hear of him? Ducky Hutton had a very nice superior shop in Main Street. He didn't have cats on, in the window or anything like that. They were very superior. And he was a big man with a loud voice and you'd be terrified of him. <laughs> and uh, uh, Uncle John would go in there and buy chocolates on his way from Mass on Sundays. And where would he put them? In his bedroom in a drawer. And you'd never see those chocolates unless you were good. 
And when you were good, you got a piece of chocolate. And I always remember it was, and I loved them, I haven't seen them for ages, those lovely Fry Cadbury's cream chocolate bars. Do you remember? They had sections. And if you were good, you got a piece. So one day I said to Sheila, what are you going to do? Uncle John asked you to do something, do it. I will not, she said, because if I'm good, he'll give me a bit of that chocolate and it smells of mott balls out of his drawer. <laughs> I won't have a piece. <laughs> I didn't care. What mott balls? I loved the chocolate. You do vegetables. Oh, he was a great gardener in the garden. He used to grow all his own vegetables. Yeah. We used to love them. And, well, of course... This would have been the beginning of the war where you were told to grow your vegetables. But he was marvellous at it. And one day we were sitting down to lunch one Sunday and we had broad beans and they were his. He'd grown them in the garden. And I said to Uncle John, they're a credit to you. And everyone roared laughing to hear that coming out of me, a young one, you know, it's a credit to you. But they were, they were lovely beans. He was lovely. Then there was a place in Patrick Street called, uh, oh God, somebody's lane. Whose lane was it? Um, Halley's Lane. Not Halley's Comet, Halley's Lane. And we used to go in there, and uh, this was years ago, and at the end of the lane there was a little place like a little farmyard, and there was a little house there with, pigs in it and to see those pigs for us was like a dream and we'd run in a few of us my friends and I and we'd look at the pigs but the man was Mr Halley he lived down opposite Morgan's in Main Street in Patrick Street and he'd shout at us to get out and you know as I grew up I wondered what was wrong with him he knew we weren't going to hurt his pigs couldn't get in even it was a half door and we couldn't get in we wouldn't have gone, we were terrified of the pigs. But he was so rude to us. And he told us he'd kick us if they if he caught us. We were terrified of him. And was there a blacksmith in town? Huh? A blacksmith. Yes, there was a blacksmith in Main Street. Murray's blacksmith. Ah, oh, the the um the forge. Oh yes. It's still called the forge, but there's shops there now. The forge was lovely, watching the blacksmith um, putting the horse's shoes on. Mm. Mr. Murray, he was a lovely man, and he wouldn't shout at us if you looked in and wanted to stand and watch him. He was a lovely man, Mr. Murray. He lived down in what they call... Um, behind the library, that place in there. Talbot Place? Talbot Street. He lived in there. Mr. Mur and Mrs. Murray and their children. But he was charming. And then they gave up the forge. At least it finished, I suppose. There weren't horses around. And, uh, <coughs> so just to finish up, we finish up soon, but just about, uh, talk about changes and all that kind of stuff, about, yes. about the role of women. I mean, if you can write, remember right back to when you were very young, Mm. and how women were in society. Quite. And how it's changed. I mean, do you want to say anything about that? Well, you know, I never noticed it when I was very young how women were treated. I know it never bothered me if they were treated. I never um, treated by the church, treated by society. I never noticed. Um, the only time I ever noticed being a woman was when I was with the army, the British army. And then I knew it was very lovely because they treated you so well. So charming and respectful and dignified. But as a child or a young woman in Tremor, I never really thought of how women were treated because they were all treated nicely and respectfully. Um, as the way, are the way. The men, you see, my father was a widower all his life, practically, well, no, since his mother, hit, my mother died. And that was a long time. And uh, he had two friends. One of them was, I don't know if you heard of Smokey Joe, 
Joe Welsh. One was his brother, Pat Welsh, a lovely man now, very different to Smokey Joe. Pat Welsh, he was a bachelor, and a Mr Dalton, who came from Priest Road, and a Mr, oh, the other man, he, they all walked together every evening when they'd come home, have their supper, go out and meet one another. And you'd see them walking down around, up the Don Rail, out the Cliff Road, always together. They were great friends. And I remember when Pat died, Pat Welsh died. They, he was the first to go. And then my father, I think, was the last. But unfortunately, I was away when he died. I was in Africa when my father died. And on the way down, we lived in Kitwe, which was the centre of Africa. And to get a ship home, I mean, we were coming home anyway. It wasn't because he died, because we didn't know. On the way home, you had to get a train for five days down from Kitwe down to Cape Town to get the boat there. And... I, on the way, you stopped at little stations and there were Africans selling their stuff that they'd made, like um, carvings and that. And one of them was uh, walking sticks. My father loved his walking stick. He always wore one down on the beach and you'd feel it on your bottom if you weren't paying attention. And I said I'd buy one from him. And I bought this lovely walking stick for him. And it was carved and I thought he'd love it. But when we got to Cape Town, we had to change trains and Bulawayo and different places. And I was, we, Dudley and I, and the two children, Alison and Edmund, were on the train for five days and four nights. And I had to wash our nappies. And Dudley put a little string up in the carriage for us, a line that I could dry them on. There were no disposable na nappies in those days. And I had to wash out his nappies and dry them. And um, when we got to Cape Town, the porter was taking the luggage out of the compartment to, to go on a taxi to go across to get the boat. When the Dudley had a strap to a case, it broke off the case and fell in two pieces on the ground. And I thought, is that an omen? A, you know. Oh, that's very awful, I said. So that was the end of it. And Edmund, I had three rows of beautiful pearls. And you know how you pull a window up in a train? Would any of you like more biscuits or coffee? There's a whole tray of them here. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so, so just to go back, can I ask, go back in time a bit? Because I want to ask you about... Had you ever been away from Ireland before you got married? No. No. So well, where did I go? So that was a huge To shock. Africa. Yeah. Never. No. Africa was my first. Can you imagine? Yeah, no. And when I was young at school, I wanted to visit Africa. And I would say, I'd love to be a nun that would go to Africa, because there's only nuns went to Africa in my day, and uh, see Africa. I never thought I'd go without being a nun, you know. Are you filming? Yeah. And, and, and so when you went first then, was that, was it a exciting as you thought? Or was it... it was very strange, very exciting. <laughs> I mean, to see an African man with a hat on him that was painted, you know, a soft hat. He would have painted it when it got old. Those kind of things, to see women with a reel of lino on her head <coughs> jumping across a ditch and other way they lived. Yeah, but that's another story. Yeah. Well said. Now, to go back to my father's stick, yeah. we got to the station in Cape Town and do you know it was August and we saw snow in on the way down on the vineyards, you know, the South African wine, on the vineyards in South Africa had snow on them in August. Mm. But Cape Town is very beautiful. I bought a lovely outfit for that little one in Cape Town, Alison, she was little then. 
and I had a three-string pearl necklace. And you know the window, you pull a strap and the window goes up and down. Edmund got my pearls and he put them into the door of the train, down into it. Oh, my God, my beautiful pearls have gone. So Dudley said, wait till we get to Cape Town and the porter will take the panel off the door and you'll get them. So we got to Cape Town and... <laughs> no, <laughs> no, it was Bulawayo we'd get to. And I thought, great, I'll get my pearls now. Got to Bulawayo, but Dudley wouldn't let me. No, he said, look, we haven't time. We've got to get the train to Cape Town. We have to get change trains here. But I said, I'll tell the porter and he'd, no, we wouldn't have time. You have to leave them. So at least I was glad I told the porter that my pearls, and he understood me, he spoke English, that my pearls were down there so he might get them for his wife. I don't think she'd ever wear them, but wasn't it good I was able to tell her, tell him. Yeah, that was, so they, the stick was another story. I, it was okay until we got to Cape Town. And then it fell off the case as the porter lifted them out and broke. And I thought, I wonder, is that a bad omen for Daddy or anyone at home? So we got to, got on the boat at Cape Town. We had three weeks on board with two little ones running around. And, you know, I lost my voice. I think I was... I lost my voice with hoarseness. I used to get hoarse in those days. No wonder I get hoarse after this. And I found a little whistle the kids had given me from a Christmas cracker. And if they went near the edge of the ship, I'd blow the whistle and they'd come back. You don't... No, you weren't walking then. No. You were a year old. Edmund was walking, well walking, yes he was, and I'd have to blow the whistle because it was very naughty. He threw my purse away, I wasn't going to let him throw anything else overboard. So it took three weeks to get back to London and got out of out London and had a pram on the roof of a taxi through London to get to Paddington Station to get the boat train to Ireland. We never flew in those days. And afterwards, of course, with the RAF, I flew everywhere. But to get back, we then got to, where did I say we? We I went to Paddington and then got the train to, got the boat to Ireland. And we didn't come to, war. we came to Dublin in the, uh, boat and Eddie, the said Eddie, the bank manager up in Calendar, I went to see Eddie and Kevin and Eileen met me, us at the. And I wondered why they were crying. I thought, you know how people cry with, they're so glad to see me home. <laughs> and I said, Kevin, why are you cry? Daddy had died. My God, I was so distracted. We arrived home on the 19th of August and Daddy had died on the 17th. But he didn't keep his funeral. He said, she, I was pregnant, six months pregnant with Eleanor. He said, I'm keeping her. I mean, it's bad enough, Kevin said, for her to come home to find he's gone. But I won't come, I won't let, have her come home to his funeral. Yeah, and that's what it would have been. It still upsets me. So, Daddy, I had, I had so many stories to tell him about Africa. So many stories and things to give him from Africa. But he was gone. He was gone. I loved him dearly. I loved him so much. But um, that was it. He had gone. And when you were in Africa, did you write to him? Oh, yes. Always. We had, in Africa, we had those airmail letters. Um, always. And he would write to me. Yeah. I remember him writing to tell me, there's a new song out soon called 
I want or something. I like that doggy in the window. And he told me this. He knew I loved songs then when I was young. And yes, I remember him writing that. Oh, he, do, he wrote lovely letters to me. He would type them on these airmail letters, but sign his own name. He'd sign that. Mm. Yes. And um, so then we came home. And how long would a letter take to get to Africa from him? Oh, a week or two, two weeks, maybe. In those days. It took a long time. And uh, when I think of it now, and then I didn't, you know, now I, I have a son, two sons in America, and I wonder how many hours are they behind us or in front of us or what are they? And one of them was, you know, somewhere else, and I'd always think of the hours. I never thought when I was in Africa or Singapore or anywhere, how many hours am I away from home? I never thought of it. I was very selfish not to. But I loved my life. I must say now, from now on, I adored and loved my life in the army. Loved it. I wouldn't wish for anything else. And what was it? Was it seeing new cases or meeting? It was people? meeting lovely people and seeing gorgeous places, very lovely places, and living there. And the servants you had there, lovely. But, but that's mean, for another story. Yeah, but that's, that was really interesting to, to see all of that. Oh, your, very interesting. In your lifetime. Wow. My mother's writing her memoirs as we speak. That was very, very, very interesting. I need a tissue. And very lovely. What? Give me one. I'll give you another she one. She her father. I very, did. Very, 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 very much. Mm. He was a lovely, quiet man. I still do love him. I still love him now. But that's life, you see. Mm. Yes. And was was he buried here in Chamor? My father is buried. No, he's buried in Knock Boy, as we used to call it, um, Ballygunna, which is just outside there, and um, with my mother and. They have a brother, I think, buried with them. And my my own brother is buried there too. Claire, you know Claire? Alice, Kevin's daughter, Alison's first cousin. Yes. Uh, she lives in England, but she comes there to see him. She goes to his grave every year. Claire loves him, loved her daddy. Yes, she, like Alison, didn't know my father. You did. You oh no, he was dead when I came back mm. from Africa, and you were born in Africa. Yeah, mm. very sad. Very very sad. I would love them to have met him, mm -mm. but that's life. And then when you came back that time, was it just for a visit? Actually, no. Dudley was in private practice there in Africa. All the cases he had there were something extraordinary. In Af but he then didn't want to go back to Africa. He wanted to change his job and do something else rather than private practice. So we did, left the children with Sheila and we went over to England because he wouldn't, couldn't practice in Ireland. He was an English barrister. He was called to the bar in Livingstone. And he did his um, apprenticeship as a solicitor in, in, in England. And so we went to, where did we go? Oh, yes. We stayed in London for a holiday for about a week. And Dudley used to go out every morning for, on, for interviews to different jobs. And I'd say to him, well, did you like that? <laughs> He'd come back in the afternoon and I'd say, did you like Yeah, I, I did. The man who was the uh, head lawyer in that office told me I'd be cock up the walk if I joined them. But I don't think I will. He didn't like that. He thought this fellow was rather pompous kind of man and he didn't join it. So then he came back to cut a long story short one afternoon, one evening, and he said to me, I met a lovely man today. He was an army officer. Uh, Lipton was his name, 
and he wants me to join the army. <clears throat> the British Army? I said, he said, yes. I said, lovely, lovely, we'll travel again. And that was this, end of it. He joined the army. And where did that love for... And that's another story. What? That's where, another story. Where did the love, the love for travel come from in your head? Like, where, what was it? I don't know. I don't know. Well, I never really... Wa Only as a child I wanted to go to Africa, and that as a nun. That's when I was a, <laughs> a mental case, when I was a child. Um, and that was up here. I, I wasn't even growing up in the Iceland. I don't know what put it into my head. Do you know what I mean? I... I I went where my husband went, and that was, was the it, end did, of it. Did, did a nun ever tell you stories about Africa or something? I never heard of Africa. Okay. Never, ever, ever. I never saw a black man since I was here. Yeah. Never. But you see, I then went to, grew to love them. They were wonderful servants and lovely, genuine, wonderful people. I had a nanny, a cook boy, a garden boy, a house boy. And they would lay down their lives for you. They were wonderful people. Wonderful. That was in Northern Odisha, it was then. Mm. It's now Kitwe. Eh, I beg your pardon, Zambia. Kitwe was the town. So I think that's the end of my story. Yeah. Uh, oh, brilliant. I forgot about poor Annie. Oh well, yeah, is there anything we left out? Yeah, can it? Can you? Can we you can just edit things? We can edit things. Yeah. Don't worry can about you just? Yeah, the end bit just there wasn't frightfully nice. No, don't worry about that. We'll sort what out. What end bit was that, Alison? You know, you're talking about servants. There's a lot of people. If this goes viral, they'll send you hate mail and shit. No, 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 no they, they won't. won't. Do you know what I'm saying? Sue, <coughs> so, no, there's a lovely story. Yeah. Sorry, isn't it? Right. It's not doing. Uh, you know, did you want to say the story about Annie? And a Murphy. Uh, yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of things that happened on the beach. Oh yeah. Tragedy things. Okay. Like there's 43 ships that came in, but most of the people were saved. 43 ships have come into Tremor Bay. Remember. Do you remember we saw all the um, the uh, ruins of those ships down on the beach? Yeah. Was beautiful. The bones. The, yeah. the bones. The but carcasses. And the sand had gone off them, and we all saw them. And now it covered them again, and they've gone. Mum has a very poignant story about her darling little friend at this school here. Oh, my darling friend, Annie Murphy. Yeah. She was here one day with me for tea one day. Annie was a perfect lady. I loved her dearly, as an old woman like myself and as a young girl at school. And she was up here. Annie lived in um, the Arch, as this was called in those days. I think it's called a paper shop now, the Arch. But she and her old, she was about seven or eight, and her older sister was fifteen, and they went down for a swim one day. And she was only a little thing, and Annie, the, the sister undressed, left her clothes on the rocks, and went out for the swim. And Annie was left to look after the clothes, because she did in those days. And she um, never came back. The sister was drowned. Annie didn't know. Annie was too young. She didn't know what drowning was. So she sat and sat until people started going home for their tea at six o'clock. She was telling us this story herself. And I didn't know it, and I grew up with Annie in Tremor. And I didn't know that happened to her. Darling Annie, she was a lovely person. And she married and she became a power. And she had one lovely son. I met with her one day. And so somebody took her home. They went and asked her, where did she live? Well, no, you know, you saw a little girl on her own after tea time. So they brought her home to her mother and found out that the girl was drowned. It was terribly sad. Now, she was found later, the daughter, the sister. But for Annie, I don't think she ever forgot it. She couldn't forget that. And the drownings that used to go on on that beach was something else in, when I was young. So often every summer, you'd look down on the beach and you'd see a crowd and you'd say, 
oh my God, someone's drowned. And that's what you'd say. And we had an old uh, boathouse down, it was, what, where would it be now? The end of, the end of the prom. No, the beginning of our prom here. There was a big boathouse, a big black boathouse, big door, wooden door. And they brought the bodies in there when someone was... I remember it so well. There were so many of them. I remember a boy was about seven or eight and he got into difficulties out there. And I was on the beach and the crowd gathered and his father went out to save him. They were both drowned. I don't know why. I think now that there were holes in the sand out far and people in those days used to go out very far and they'd get into a hole and you'd be lost because you'd be out of your depth, you'd be in difficulties and that would be the end. That man lost his life over his son as well, the two of them. And there was a woman, I remember her being brought in and put on the, on the slip and tried to pump her into life but she died. And they all went into that boathouse, it's gone now, gone. There's nothing there now, I don't ask them now. But it was a very sad time. Um, we weren't told in those days, don't go out too far, I don't think. I don't know why people didn't go. But we used to have lovely castle uh, shows, didn't we? Do you remember them as children? My children would remember them. The sandcastle. The sandcastle competitions. They were lovely, yeah. I don't think they have them anymore. I don't think so, no. What sculpture now? Oh, we saw this. Che I go back. We saw the Chelsea flower show. We were watching it the oh, other TV. night on yeah, yeah. that week. I thought it was ghastly because they were all architectural. There were no flowers. It was ours is on. The Irish one is on tomorrow. Oh, blue. Thursday, blue. yeah, blue. tomorrow night. Yeah. So I shall watch that, and I believe it's beautiful, full of flowers. Not architectural. It should have been an architectural show. Okay, so is there, I just wanted to check the lads. Is there anything we left out? There's one very extraordinary thing happening right now. Yeah. Um, Sorry, 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 Oh, we're all white, some are black. Is that a racist story? <laughs> Shh. Is it? Is that racist? Is it? Was it a big shock? Culture. Yeah. But of course they were both white. But of course some of the ancestors have been black. They lived up near the church, near where Peter Flynn lives. Peter. If Peter heard me. And they were amazed this child was black. Because, oh, but they left. I, d I never knew them or her or anything growing up. I never knew them. This was when I was up at the school here. It was a big shock. One, can you imagine? Very exciting. And what about things like adoption? Well, that was, adoption? Was yeah. I never heard of adoption when I was young, I think. No, no. I never knew anyone that had been adopted. You know how the girls today or boys would say they were adopted, never heard of it. And they what, could have been. And what about places like, you know, the, the Good Shepherds, where young women... Ah, the Good Shepherds. I used to have their, her little dresses made there when I came home on holidays, and Edmund's little suits. Oh, they were beautiful. They used to embroider them beautifully. Um, and they did the communion for, for all the churches in Waterford. Did they? Oh, yeah. Are yeah. you see them on uh, the Good Shepherd laundry? Yeah. As we go, I used to have the laundry done there, and when I'd come home on holiday, and you see a crocodile, as we call it, of children, you know, and following one another and the teacher, and there were the little orphans from there. It was little orphans who were in the um, Good Shepherd. Yeah. Very well dressed. The little boys would have trousers too long for them. 
shorts that were down all over their knees. So that was the only difference. They were as happy as anything, holding one another's hands, walking along. They would take them to a cinema or something. Mm. And so just to finish off, just about Tremor, like it was obviously a very small case when you were small. Very small. Yeah. Very. And most people would know each other. Absolutely. And like, what is it about Tremor? I mean, I suppose, I mean, what did you love about What was the thing that you really loved about Tremor? I don't know. I loved the closeness of it. They're walking out of the house and going shopping in Tremor, going to the shops and meeting people. People were lovely. Everyone was nice to one another. Everyone knew one another and we were all pals. There was nothing that was unusual. Um... You would talk, you were trying to talk about the aristocracy and that in Tremor. There was no aristocracy in Tremor. The only aristocracy would have been uh, re, um, the Galways. But they were lovely people. Tommy Galway, you sing in the, we'd have concerts. Oh, they were fun. Down in the assembly rooms, local people singing. And um, the butcher's boy that used to deliver meat to us. Uh, Malloy's boy, Jimmy Whalen, he was acting them. And uh, I remember answering the door to Jimmy Malo Jimmy Whalen one day, and it was just after one of the concert, and I called him Strolling Mall, because that was his part in the play. And Dodie came behind me, you know, to collect the meat. Oh, don't react, call him that. Don't call Jimmy Strolling Mall, he mightn't like it. And Jimmy said, I like it, Miss Connington. He said, I don't mind being called. I prefer it than being called too early in the morning. That's when I heard the first time I heard that expression. But there were lovely concerts. And we had this woman, she was saying, I'm only a bird in a gilded cage. And she said, oh, this size, to this size. And she was get up on the stage and sing that song to everybody's delight. We all loved it. I'm only a bird in a gilded cage. There were so many others. Who were the others you see? Dilda Dull. Oh, that was a school up here in St. Joseph's. You know St. Joseph's in the school up here? It's a room. And we were there and you'd hear anything out on the road that was passing. And there was one day we heard this, dill the doll, dill the doll, dill, and she'd click her heels like this. This old one lived up on the, in the 24s, and she used to walk down the town singing, dill the doll, dill the doll, and clicking her heels all the time. And we'd get a fit of laughing at school and be murdered for it. The teacher would say, stop that laugh, and you'd try to keep it in, but dill the doll would be out there singing. So she was called Dilda Doll. If you saw her, that's who she was. What? They hit you at school. Say it out loud. They hit you at school. They were tough in school, the teachers. Tough. There was one teacher. She was horrible. She used to smack us on the wrists with stick, stick. And um, then we had another teacher. Oh, she was a darling. She was a lovely teacher. The nuns weren't bad at all. They never smacked you. But this one, she was the only one on the head. She smacked Sheila on the head one day. And Dodie, my aunt, went up to her, which was a thing she hated doing. And she said to her, you can smack her on the legs. You can smack her on the hands, but don't you dare smack her on the head. It's dangerous to smack a child on the head. She never did again. Oh, but you see, you, I used to be sorry for the poor country girls that had come in and wouldn't know the answer to the questions. And they'd stand there knowing they didn't know what the answer was. And the teacher would rile them to try and get the answer out of them. And the tears would start to flow. Mm. And we, as pupils, we'd be so sorry for them. And some of them had no shoes. They'd walk in for the metal man in bare feet in those days. And I remember Sheila getting a pair of boots for this poor girl. Boots, 
she wanted, not Jews. You felt very sorry for them. Tinkers used to come, as we called them, travellers. And I had a little friend, a traveller, and she would come to our door. I, I would have been, what, about 14 or 15. And she'd come to the door, but she wouldn't want money as most of them would want. She'd want food. And I'd give her food, and she'd be very grateful. And years later, I met her outside Lodger's shop one day, and uh, she had a baby. And poor little thing, I felt so sorry for her. But I, she was grand, she was fine, she told me. She had a husband, so he was uh, able to provide for her. They were very poor in those days. They used men pots and pans, they'd come along with their... Um, the reason they were called tinkers, they tinked, they used to make noise tinkering at saucepans. They'd have little washers they'd put in your saucepan to repair it. Nobody would repair a saucepan now, but in those days you did, these aluminium saucepans. And you'd put a stopper in it, like a little washer. And this is what these men used to do. And they'd hammer away and they were called tinkers. And then a man used to come with a sharpener for your knives and scissors and all that sort of thing. And he'd have a wheel that went around. And then you'd get another fellow coming along singing and he thought he was marvellous. He'd have a... Uh, tin whistle? What? A tin whistle? A tin whistle! The very thing. He used to have a tin whistle. And he'd play the tin whistle. And he'd expect to be paid for it, and he was. People would give him pennies. Life was very... Innocent in those days, very, very innocent. But it was very lovely, very, very lovely. And I only wish the children of today, but they're all very happy in what they have, would have little innocent times like that. But they have their little things they play with, their computers and their phones, and they're not always good, you hear. On television, I hear these things. They, uh, so but however, thank you very much. Not at all. It was a pleasure yeah, to talk to you. Great. Well, you are a great yeah. help. A great memory. It's it's a great memory. memory. Yeah. I have, I have, and please God, I shall remain with it. Do you know? I feel sorry for people to lose their minds. I know. Don't think she's going to, do you, no. Jeff? Oh. Yeah. I don't know. Touch wood, please God, I won't. You were brilliant.